we have with us Ricardo Tomasini. Um, Ricardo had visited the Noesis Center a um, few years ago, five or six years ago, maybe seven years ago. 2015. 15, okay, so seven years ago. And they spent uh, six months or so um, with us. And uh, we remember, I remember doing a, um, a semantic web for streaming data tutorial with Ricardo and with uh, Emmanuel, who um, uh, is a professor in Italy and yes. um, was Ricardo's advisor. I think that the tutorial is, uh, you know, for streaming data, I think it was a good bit of content we had in those times. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it is, in fact, if you look at our uh, AI Institute's uh, YouTube channel on tutorials, you'll find the recording of those tutorials things. Then Ricardo completed his um, PhD with um, uh, uh, Emmanuel uh, in, um, in Italy. Uh, and uh, uh, I tried to have him, uh, you know, consider do PhD with us. But uh, he was too much of an European, and he wanted, uh, you know, European quality of life. So he chose to um, remain there, uh, you know. And then uh, he went to uh, Tallinn. Uh, Tartu, oh, yeah, close in Estonia, yeah. Tartu, yeah, uh, close and uh, in in Estonia uh, as an assistant professor, and now he has moved to France. Um, as a as an associate professor, um, uh, Ricardo, you know, is a colorful guy. Uh, he, he was very social and really enjoyed and made uh, you know for a wonderful added to to making our environment wonderful. He is visiting us for a week, uh, starting um, he's arriving here on twentieth. Uh, he's going to Sigmet conference before coming to us, and then. He'll be here for uh, most of the week, uh, week after next, or whatever that week is, uh, week of twenty uh, first of um, June. Uh, so we'll have interaction. I was talking to him. He has some interest in knowledge infusion. So we'll, we'll let's hope that we can have some good um, brainstorming. So in preparation for that, and otherwise, I thought let's just have his uh, uh, talk here. What he's thinking about. And then he, when he's visiting, he'll hear more about what we are thinking about and we go from there. So over to you, Ricardo. Okay, thank you for the nice introduction. I actually prepared this picture, which we took when I was there. Uh, it was another one where we also have uh, Tiramisu, which we did, did a workshop and things. So uh, yeah, long time has passed and now I am uh, an associate professor, so I have to uh, thank a lot. That experience was really, really formative for me. Um, um, although Dr. Shet already presented a bit uh, what I did uh, at the time, I uh, just want to give you a bit of context of who I am and what I do. Uh, I will say, in a summary, I am a data enthusiast in the sense that I like data in general. Uh, I started with my PhD, which was in Italy, on semantic web. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about Semantic Web. Mostly it was uh, related to linked data. Uh, the idea is trying to stress the most part of, uh, mostly the relational part, the relationship across data points. I recall uh, one lecture of uh, Dr. Shet where he was saying that the relational model is a misname, right? Because the relation are not first class. So one of the pillars of the Semantic Web was indeed applying graph models everywhere to uh, highlight this interconnection. And then two things are very important here, a stack of technologies that uh, promotes interoperability and um, a set of best practice on how to share data across organization. Uh, Semantic web have been criticized a lot in, but uh, nowadays it exists. There are a nice example like schema.org and Google Knowledge Graph and uh, actually, I will have a slide later on commercial knowledge graphs. Uh, so that was where I started my work, and uh, um, I did my PhD in this. And when I moved to Estonia, and this is a bit a bit, a bit later, so I'm getting I aged a bit in the picture. I started working on data engineering, and I know if you know a bit about data engineering, that was my teaching and research 
uh, area as well in the context of big data as well. So there are some uh, uh, similarities with semantical things. And what I focus there is like trying to understand what is the figure of the data engineer, how it relates with other professions like the software engineer and data scientist, mostly on the educational point of view, and uh, trying to figure out how to make tools that can aid you know, the uh, ability of people to do data cleansing, data preparation, and how to uh, speed up ingestion and uh, up to the level where we have to you know, ask questions about the data and visualize them. So trying to be full stack. Uh, lately, like uh, uh, since last October, I moved to France in uh, Lyon, which is a very nice city, a way warmer than Estonia, like way warmer. And uh, here I, I brought a bit the scope and I'm working on data management. In particular, I work on query optimization, data modeling and storage models, and advanced query languages. In particular, I focus on their semantics, try to formalize them, and then you know, apply the various things I mentioned before. My focus is on graphs. Uh, in particular, everything started when in uh, uh, 2019, we went to a Dagestan seminar organized by the professor of Sherik Sak, which unfortunately passed away during the pandemics. Uh, and uh, we uh, created, we wrote this uh, nice vision paper called The Future is Big Graph. I will add knowledge graphs. And uh, this was uh, published on the CACM communication journal. So you can find there the vision of how we see the data management community should move towards this data interconnection, how to exploit it also for AI purposes. So also to foster the connection with AI technologies. So what is the feel of Uge? Please. Ricardo, uh, can I ask you one question in the middle? Please, absolutely. Uh, interrupt me yeah. anytime you want. No problem. Yeah. So since uh, Semantic Web has been around, right, for almost 20 years, since uh, yeah. Jim Handler talked about that. So I'm just kind of curious, uh, uh, what's new now? Because the big graphs has, people have talked about it and they have analyzed uh, telco graphs and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So is there something which is uh, triggering the new wave or... I mean, we can definitely read the paper. Are you talking so, about, yeah. So you, your question is uh, on the technological stack or on the, what we mean with semantic web? What is research community in semantic web focusing on these days? What are the to uh, hot topics for the semantic web community like at ISWC or ESWC? Okay, mainly I will say two things. One is indeed the combination with the AI technology which has somehow black boxes. So. Uh, there, there, there is this idea that uh, um, the semantic web part, which belongs to AI, let's say, semantic web, from, I see semantic web as a join between, a liaison between uh, AI and database for me. The part that focuses on AI is definitely trying to push towards uh, the combination uh, of uh, other for, inductive form of AI. And here we see the development of technique technologies to build knowledge graphs to uh, clarify the neural network behavior. Knowledge I see knowledge infused learning as something that definitely can benefit uh, the semantic web community. I saw papers about it. I saw works on uh, um, um, like ap approximate learning using approximate reasoning using neural networks, uh, which were very interesting. And uh, this is one side. The second side, which was is more related to web and databases that's really pushing towards decentralization. So the idea that the data should not stay in the hand of a single vendor. And uh, to this extent, the data should flow in a way that is uh, as smooth as possible. And uh, there is a huge work on data ownership and how this can comply with the current web stack. So how can I retain the ownership of my data physically and logically without neglecting myself access to the service the web offers. And I think this is reasonable in combination with the fact that the web has been more and more centralized by the advent of social networks, in particular Facebook, but in general, that to retain your data, not just the data we put in, but everything which is elicited on the data we generate and somehow cut us out from the equation of controlling this data. So these are the two things I see 
most popular. Uh, of course, there are smaller trends, one of which I am uh, uh, supporter, which is uh, the stream reasoning initiative, which tries to combine semantic technologies with uh, um, streaming analytics technologies, try to make them fast and reactive. But this is a ways smaller scale comparing to the other two things I mentioned. I hope I give you like a perspective. Did I answer your question? Uh, I think it dropped the connection. Go ahead, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So back to the presentation, like uh, what is the field of the connection across all these technologies I mentioned uh, in my brief yet uh, intense career so far? Uh, data velocity is what I usually bring. Uh, data velocity is a big data dimension that questions that poses the need of uh, addressing data uh, as fast as possible. Actually, before data are no longer valuable, because there is this intuition that uh, I can perform historical analysis. They're good for certain kind of application, but there is a spectrum of things that requires reactivity. Uh, there are kind of questions whose answer is valid in a specific point in time. And if I'm observing data as a receiver, I need to process them, make sense of them as soon as I can. Uh, this becomes even harder in presence of variety, which means that if I have to combine a lot of heterogeneous sources, data integration typically is the bottleneck. And uh, a good example is the one minute in, in the, in, on the internet, like every minute, there are a ton of information that I share from different sources. And if I want to have an holistic picture of what's going on, uh, I must have technologies that allow me to integrate different formats, different other models, perhaps express queries across different systems and combine the answer together. This in presence of uh, noise, incompleteness, and other problems that you probably know uh, better than I do as, you know, AI Institute. So this is about what I did. And now I'm going to pose the attention on three things, as I mentioned in my abstract, uh, like the three pillars of data management, like very, put in very simple terms, and how I think they should uh, help, how they can help us understand the landscape of why they AI. Uh, so what what, we should, what what I would like to give my contribution, let's say. So the three pillars are obviously data. Well, without them, what are we talking about? Questions, or you can see them as, I usually see them as queries, but I'm talking about question in a broader sense, meaning an information need, something I need to do to, to obtain from the data to, to give to the users. So the users are an important part. And system, which are the component that connects the two parts. So they store the data, they require us to uh, rationalize it, perhaps normalizing it, and they take the question in from the users, they under try to understand the question and they apply the question to the data in order to get an answer. So I'm not gonna go too much in detail of what is the system landscape because uh, it's a maze. Like if you look at what industry Hindu is doing, what academia is doing, this is the picture of 2021. Actually, it doesn't fit completely the slide. Uh, you can count uh, more than 2000 different systems focusing on things from analytics to uh, NLP. Uh, all of them have AI components, all of them have data system, are data systems meaning that they deal with data and they deal with questions, right? So they try to get you, get you an answer, which can be what is the most convenient uh, virtual machine in my cloud network to deploy my application from what is the most ap appropriate uh, model to recommend a bunch of movies to my users on Netflix, right? So the, the landscape is so huge, so varied, varied that is really hard to navigate. There is an interesting, uh, this uh, uh, landscape slide is actually one of the attempt to rationalize. I will have a link later when I share my slides, um, but it's Matt Turk is the author and it's quite interesting. Instead, I think uh, what is particularly interesting here is uh, the question about data. 
So what about data? Well, so far, uh, from a database point of view, I will argue that the focus of the data, the AI community has been a lot of data collection. Okay, so the, if I look at what the AI people have done as a database person, I see a huge effort in identifying data sets, things that are important and they can be uh, studied, uh, trying to understand the different components uh, that have to train, to test, to validate, identifying trends, focusing on analytics to describe them, and then you know, apply uh, technology, techniques from deep learning to standard data mining, it doesn't matter. The idea here is a few years ago emerged the problem of bias. So we start questioning ourselves, what is good data? Like, are we uh, actually identifying uh, the right part of the, are we actually targeting the problem from the right point of view? And now, if you look at the debate um, out there, the question is how the model is sustainable. So uh, this relates a lot with system. We have a lot of data, probably too much, okay? And very few uh, companies, organizations are capable of processing them to some extent. Can we maintain this trend forever? What is going to be next? Uh, what is missing in this in this point, though? Uh, so we'll just redo it. What about data? So that's the second part of the second pillar, right? Um, I would say, as a database person, if I look at what the AI community has been doing on the data perspective. The focus has been a lot of collection uh, with the issues of uh, finding data to train, to test, and to validate the models, and uh, you know, consequently use cases you know, with a lot of collaboration with different domains. Uh, in this case, social media has been quite you know, uh, a heaven where we can find uh, fuel for any possible uh, technology. Then uh, the problem of bias emerged, and uh, we start questioning ourselves what is good data and how we can uh, uh, identify the problems before even uh, applying um, AI techniques. And finally, the discussion today is set on the point of sustainability, whether the, which relates to system a lot. And uh, even the fact we have probably too many data for, or to, for us to process, uh, how we can uh, sustain the current model of training considering that uh, it costs a lot of money, not just money, there is an environmental impact, et cetera, et cetera. So this as a, as a summary. The question is, is this all? Not really. There is another aspect that concerns the data collection and curation, which is the missing context. I'm sure you're used to this kind of uh, uh, graph, uh, this kind of uh, infographics, which shows how data itself doesn't add too much. And uh, adding up different level of context can lead us to un understand things. And uh, uh, the point for me is, the, 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 the insight lands in the connection across data points, which is what we have to navigate in order to obtain the information we need. This has been uh, has given a re-rise of uh, the metadata initiative, which is you know, data about data, and uh, um, motivated by the fact that the lack of context leads to you know, bad, uh, bad technologies classical uh, uh, classical uh, um, quote here is garbage in, garbage out. This has sparked different initiatives, including the attempt of uh, uh, merging together context in deep neural network and other technologies for uh, machine learning. Um, the contribution that my community, I would say the community of data management has given to this country is knowledge graph. And here I can show uh, the, how the adoption of knowledge, knowledge graph has been spreading across different organization. And uh, now we can talk about commercial knowledge graphs. Things that uh, five years ago, when I started my PhD, seven years ago, when I started my PhD, were uh, in the hand of just a few organizations, Google and Facebook mostly. Now is a technology that has spread and can contribute to making data more less biased and our model more accurate. The third pillar I have uh, in my scheme is a question. Oh, there is a question in chat. No, no, no. I just, uh, you know, old uh, work on metadata is a pretty um, old field. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, very extensively uh, studied. 
There was a book that we did a while ago, a long time ago, with all kinds of digital media. It was very interesting in those days. Uh, now the now the term is a data catalog. They refresh a bit the, but that is just metadata. I prefer to call it in the old way. Mm. Right, so uh, now the last point, uh, talk about system briefly, talk about data and uh, metadata indeed. What about qu uh, questions? So what about them? I told you at the beginning, my point was being a bit question in a, in a broader sense, like an information need, something I need to know, okay? So uh, I'm gonna, you know, this is a kind of a conversation. So what do you think is the overall goal of uh, why they are, or, you know, general artificial intelligence. What is your two cents? I'm actually asking for real. So is there anybody want to share his opinion? I know that I shot yours because, you know, I follow your publications, but in general, what do you think general artificial intelligence or wide artificial intelligence is about? Anybody, any courageous PhD student? Sorry, Ricardo, can you clarify the question? So what, what is like, um, uh, yeah, so let's, uh, let me clarify. For me, a data, I'll give you an example. What is the point of a database? Database is meant to uh, like navigate, uh, organize knowledge in a, as fast as possible. That's what the database is about. So the goal of AI, in a broader, as if we have a box and we call it, you know, this is the AI, what it would be? Why are we spending money, time, and efforts in building an AI, uh, generalizing AI as much as we can? Um, so, so there are two parts. One is why to have AI, and the second is why to generalize AI. Uh, so the the first part, why to have AI, right? We have many many uh, questions, many reasons, but one or many perspective. But one perspective is uh, as a decision support tool. Right, and uh, as intelligent system, as uh, intelligent agent, as uh, Stuart Russell say, calls it, and to the other part, which is uh, to generalize, it is just because to make it data efficient, because we we have uh, we don't just solve one problem, right? We we live in the real world where problems just come unannounced. So, exactly. Just to, exactly. I I totally agree. So, what is my opinion, just to, this is, I'm presenting, but uh, this is just an opinion. I'm not, uh, the goal is automated data processing, what you call data efficiency, exactly. But the thing is, uh, there is a way to match data. Like we will never be able to process it manually. Like a database does what it's meant to do. I can, you know, put the data in, ask my query. There is a certain scale where this is human understandable, even with the data that are clearly normalized and clean and neat. When we reach a certain scale, it doesn't matter if the data are clean or neat. I simply don't have the time to go through them, right? So in a world that keeps pouring data every minute, right? The, our only hope to make sense of this is develop something that filters things for us, right? Uh, you can imagine like uh, a nice analogy here is that every year since like uh, the, 20, the beginning of the 20, 2000s, every year are published more books than you can possibly read in your life, even if you read one book per day, right? So every year, the amount of book which is published is a way beyond capacity. So in this sense, we need a tool, we need something that you know, can approach information a way faster than us and can help us create the things we care about. And uh, here I will say a note, arguably, Unstructured data are the most interesting, right? The thing where we cannot really uh, search for them in a way that uh, is uh, semi-automatic with the technology we have been using so far. And then I would say also, second point is natural language. Like the thing that, as I say, books, for example, thing that require a lot of effort, even for us to understand. And here I give you a couple of examples. So text summarization is probably one of the most uh, peculiar application of NLP that, that we need, right? We have so many articles, so many technologies, that even if we can index them all, okay, we still have to read them and process and understand them. 
So be able to have an accurate text summarization technique is a priority because it will help us understand uh, faster if something is appropriate, useful, necessary for us to process, right? It's the same idea. Why do we write abstracts for our paper? We are the text summarization technology, right, in that sense. We try to give people the information. Do we need that or not? And here are emerging technologies. Like uh, this is something I'm passionate about, Clever, which is a deep learning uh, benchmark for uh, visual question answering. Uh, arguably, every uh, sufficiently big application in AI now has an NLP component. In this context, uh, is a benchmark meant for neurosymbolic. The idea here is uh, being able to answer questions like those listed down there, where you have uh, techniques like uh, comparison of, uh, num of numbers, the object recognition, uh, characteristic recognition, like uh, every object in the scene is uh, arguably complex. You have uh, shapes, material, color, and et cetera. And the, uh, the benchmark aims at identifying spatially the technology. Here we've been doing some work on uh, um, like approximate reasoning. We have a, a semantically annotated version of the benchmark. Using uh, description logic, we created a, a completely logical representation of the scenes. And now we are trying to understand if that can be used to improve the accuracy of existing model processing clever data, which, uh, for example, fails quite badly, existing approaches fail quite badly, I understand transitivity. So if you extend a bit the question and ask, is there something on the left, on the object, on the object on the left of the red sphere, boom, they fail, because they, the way they are engineered really don't uh, incorporate this kind of transitive, transitive hope. So, uh, going a bit forward, the point here is a uh, is, uh, language and reason. The, uh, the observation is, uh, um, okay, we are focusing on data processing. We're focusing on collecting data to understand questions, but what about the way we communicate? Like that can help us understand better where AI is going, because at the end of the day, I need to communicate with the, you know, this supposed to be smart box that uh, is solving problem for me, right? And uh, uh, here is a nice book I would recommend you. Unfortunately, I cut out the author from the picture. Uh, it's Noam Chomsky, you know, the father of you know contextual grammars, and uh, is about language and evolution. The title of the book is "Why Only Us," trying to you know dig deeper on what make us unique as people, as the animals who speak, okay, and what does differ from other animals. So I'm gonna give you a little puzzle, okay. So a student goes to turn his paper to a professor. And after looking at two pages, the teacher asks, I want to read it with a plain tone, OK? Are you sure you want to turn this in? Now, I wrote the sentence in, I colored the sentence in red. Uh, does anybody think, does anybody know what the question means? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's a good uh, way to say that there is a lot more, uh, you know, depth to this particular, uh, pro you know, sentence. Um, it cannot be uh, literally um, understood. Uh, interpreted. Yeah, exactly. Uh, for it to, the, clearly, the teacher uh, is questioning about the quality of uh, clearly, uh, right? The, the report and paper and. Um, uh, is possibly willing to allow the student to spend more effort and time to do something better than what he seems to have done. Exactly. So the question is already about the confidence of the student is about is a proxy for the quality, right? And uh, in my brief uh, research, uh, I am not uh, I was not capable of identify good models for subtext analysis, something like that, right? So I'm going to give you another puzzle. What does this image suggest to you in your own words? I'm getting to the point of my presentation. So, uh, yeah, the yeah. young ones are welcome to comment here because this is like uh, uh, Twitter yesterday. So, it should be anybody can describe what they see.
Why are students shy? I don't know why. I'm, I don't bite. Actually, I'm very nice. Come on. I, I, uh, I'm going to... Nobody can describe? Come on, there is there a guy. Are the people who, seems, uh, who seem to be fighting while there's another person who doesn't really care about what's happening. Now. Exactly. What, what is the point of it? The guy up, up front doesn't care. Yeah. Right? That's the, the image can be summarized is something going on and a guy doesn't care. So this was on Twitter and a guy commented extremely high meme potential. But if you go to technologies for understanding how the image is or the image is about, which try to layer the analysis, they will try to answer the question where the image is located, who are these people, but what's going on, it's gonna tell you something like, there's a fight on the background and there's a person eating a cheeseburger on the front looking at his phone, okay? So the multi-level analysis, please, please, Ricardo, for a database person, you are asking a very heavy duty AI, AI question. I know, I know. That's uh, the, the, the idea here, right? It's really tricky, but uh, the point is we are not focusing. This is a hard problem. Right? I was trying to look for a hard problem, right? Something that breaks existing things. And uh, like the multi level analysis breaks it. Like this person is the same person who says yes, raise his hand. You don't have to speak, just uh, raise your hand on. on who thinks these three people are the same people? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, cool. So we have, uh, you, first of all, you're not sleeping, nice. <laughs> Second, uh, and now, so the guy at the center is a picture taken on the set of the movie Inception. Okay, but the other pictures, they are, I added more, but the three I show you are actually frames from the movie. So arguably they are not DiCaprio, they are the person DiCaprio impersonate, right? This fine grace and distinction is essentially impossible if you don't incorporate the context, impossible. So here they come my current work and what I would like to, you know, involve you if you're interested because it's kind of cool, I think it's also fun. It's the meme analytics project, which exists. You can go to meme4.science. And what we are trying to do is uh, try to build a knowledge graph of internet memes, which uh, pose substantial new challenges. Detection of situations like this that are memeable, meaning they have a layer structure of meaning and they can convey complex, semantically rich information. Okay. They can be instantiated in different applications. So, I can apply the picture of the guy who doesn't care to my PhD proposal, to a soccer game, to whatever, right? It doesn't matter. It's completely orthogonal. And generation, are we able to generate these memes automatically? That would be super awesome. And uh, I don't think so, because we miss essential component in the understanding of the context. But just to give you a bit of scientific background here, because you know I'm talking and chatting, but what is a meme? A meme is the cultural equivalent to a gene in the DNA. So you know, DNS, DNA. So there was a book called The Selfish Gene where Richard Dawkins defined what if it exists a unit of culture, which is transferable in the same way a characteristics of the individual can be transferred using genes. This go on like a song, a poem, a movie, and they went on and on until they reached the web and the web exacerbated it, okay? So the idea is that an internet meme is a piece of culture, typically a joke, but is arguable, which gains influence through online transmission, okay? And I argue the fact it is a joke because memes are not inherently funny. They are funny because they are relatable, okay? I can write a meme about a depressed person and that's not funny at all but I can smile when I see it because I relate to it because maybe I'm living a very particular situation. And there is a website called Know Your Meme, which is essentially a Wikipedia of internet memes, which we scrape continuously. We clean data, we prepare them. 
and we're able to extract information like bo info boxes. And we enrich the data in three ways, using uh, Google Vision for the image itself, DBpedia Spotlight to get entity associated with the image and the text that surrounds it. And uh, we also are doing user service to ask people to annotate the intent memes using prepared text that comes from the, um, the, knowledge, the Wikipedia, the PDF. Uh, this is an example of uh, the triangle, sem the semantic triangle when it applies to intent memes. So on the top, you have an abstract concept, a thought, right? An awkward situation. And you have a meme template which is a blank picture, typically a picture can be a video too. And uh, it represents the meaning of it. Like the awkward bomber seal is an advice animal macro series that fetus a seal in a funny position and express awkwardness. This can be instantiated, meaning that I can apply this template to a domain. And uh, when a high five was intended to, to, for the guy behind you. So you're like, oops, right? This is kind of, Making something understand this is extremely sophisticated and potentially extremely useful. I have ideas on how to apply this. So this is a figure of the pipeline that we built, how we collect the data, how we scrap it. There is a huge data engineering work here to go from completely unstructured text to this, right? A huge knowledge graph with uh, hundreds of thousands of entities connected we have a very little clue, clue on how they are connected, but I found this work fascinating on so many points of view and actually hard for computer science, right? So the, uh, I'm super happy to you know, get your questions, but if you don't want to write, I keep my secrets. That's it. Very, um... Uh, interesting topic. Uh, Amita also works on uh, meme. Is he still there? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so Ricardo, thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It's very interesting. So have you seen uh, some of the shared tasks we have organized? We call it promotion. So we so, added on same eval, same eval for one time. And this year in the AI, triple AI. Yeah, you the mean they work on, I saw they work related to emo emojis mostly. I saw there were no, some no. works on, on memes as well. No, 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 no. So, so we released, uh, you know, large scale data on Memotion. We call it Memotion. Ah, uh, Memotion. No, sorry. I, and then I understood emotion, emotion. Okay, no. No, I'm sorry. I missed okay. that one. So you can, uh, it's cool. Uh, right. Okay. So that's one. So yeah, so very interesting. Now my second question to you, I, I got the memes and etc. But the example you show about the Leonardo DiCaprio example. So identifying the people, uh, uh, same people from multiple, uh, you know, images and identifying their roles. So how how you are targeting that problem? I, I could not connect to that. No, no, that was more like a provocation in the context of the presentation. Like the goal of that slide is reality is more complex than you think. Right, a question like, is this the same person? Obviously, yes, that's the same actor, right? But we need to focus on actually what the person on the other side is asking. Like, uh, and the context there tells you, did they ask you what are the same actors? Are these the same real world person or are they conceptually the same person? The, the, the example is borderline and is meant to uh, you know, provoke a bit and say, look, the, uh, the question is not that simple. Like you are, you know, neglecting so the piece of reality. Maybe it's a good uh, way to do it. You, know, you don't have to consider yeah, so, it. Okay. So that was just an example to, you know. Yeah, yeah. just uh, for the sake of a presentation. Okay. <laughs> yes, okay. yes. Okay. Yeah, nice work. Thanks. There's a lot of things in the chat. Let me see. How do you define wisdom? To my, my understanding, that, uh... yeah, no, okay. This is a quite a deep question, indeed. Yeah, I, I don't. To say that. Yes. Uh... If I, I did not know you had this um, interest, so we, we can have a lot of discussions. But go ahead. That's pretty uh, very cool. I, I am. Uh, I, I love philosophy, so some we can... papers on knowledge graph, and that's why just a question on it. Good. Okay. So I'm glad you asked. All these guys who are supposed to be to, to have a lot, a uh, lot more reading, and they didn't ask any such question. So the credit to you. 
But the memo show, I just see the link, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, it's tied to senti do the sentiment analysis of the memes, right? If I understood uh, briefly from the website. Yes, it a sarcastic. Is. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, here the idea, so, so to be frank, like uh, there is some work existing on memes. I'm not the, the first person who invented it, uh, but uh, it's uh, at distance level, right? Uh, some person applies, uh, shares a meme. What does he mean? What what he really meant? Is was he happy? Was he sad? Here is uh, trying to understand an aspect of the communication pattern that is very human, peculiar, and also impossible for a machine, which is just a position. Like I have two concepts, I want to overlap them, right? And the sum of the two is bigger than each of them. And uh, why memes are cool? Okay, I am a nerd, so that's the first reason. But the second reason is they are extremely fast. Remember, the food fuel loses velocity. I don't, if you know the meme, I don't have to explain it to you. You get it right away. And uh, like with Dr. Shet, we were, uh, we were brainstorming a bit when we met before my visit and say, imagine that you have an autistic kid, right? And you are trying to communicate with it. The communication happens on a level that uh, we don't really control, right? So if you could study what triggers the communication in these things, the impact is potentially very interesting in this example, for example, but also interlingual communication. I mean, you, we don't speak English, but we share I don't know, some sort of things that can let, lead us to, you know, communicate somehow. I'm Italian, so I speak with my hands, and that's a joke, but actually it's true. Uh, it, it's easier for me to get in touch with specific kind of cultures than others, right? For example, now I live in France, the culture is so close that the communication is easier even if I don't speak fluent French, right? And this aspect in memes are perfect to be studied with computer and science methods, because we have a lot of them, they, they, they are like the equivalent of fruit flies in, uh, in, in online communication. They spark in a day, at the end of the day, they reach worldwide the diffusion, and in a week after, nobody cares anymore. Actually, there is a life cycle of memes, they become uh, dunk, it's said in the terms, right? They get so used and uh, they lost their meaning. They kind of explode. This is perfect for us because we are good at processing all things fast, right? So the I think uh, this uh, potential area of study, the semantic interconnection, the juxtaposition, is extremely peculiar. It can benefit a lot of things, uh, and this necessarily requires uh, the two, right? The semantic annotation, the context, and the uh, the induction aspect. Uh, you cannot do this with a database. Database will never tell you uh, what a meme is about. It's impossible. You need something more, something infused with the knowledge. And uh, yeah, so I thought it was a good topic uh, we could talk together because it sounds like... Uh, sure. We'll definitely talk on this um, a very interesting topic and we can go on and go on. So, so we find out, you know, the humor, sarcasm, irony, and culture specific. The last mm -hmm. one you mentioned. Yeah. The aspect even we collected a lot of you know culture specific memes and we saw that german memes are very dry even if you don't <laughs> understand that culture you know, don't understand what what people are talking about so yeah so a lot of aspects um, definitely i mean a lot of work should happen in this area it's a very interesting idea we'll talk again sure awesome so there is a question raise hand please hi 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 ricardo thank you for the talk it was a nice talk i wanted to ask so Almost all the memes uh, I have come across, they're funny, but they're mostly uh, sarcastic or either cynical or ironic, uh, main three traits, I think. So yes. if, when you're, when you're uh, creating the database, do you have a method to kind of uh, annotate or like... Uh, the emotion, annotate? you mean? Yep. Uh, the, whether they're sarcastic or cynical or ironic. Do you do that? If you do. At, at the moment, no. What we okay. do is that, uh, so um, how can I explain? Like, you know, so the thing is, at the moment, what I'm interested in at the moment is uh, trying to understand the abstract meaning. Like you share, everybody knows one, one doesn't simply walk into murder. I guess it's a very common meme. Uh, that means 
what you're talking about is not easy. That's what the meaning is, right? Then it can be said, uh, if you share that, that meme in a context when I'm doing a, a cancer surgery, it's probably cynical, right? If I share that meme when I am uh, losing, uh, I'm one score less in a football match, it's probably ironic, right? So my point is being memes, uh, like, um, uh, Communication shortcuts, they are so semantically rich, but also extremely punctual. It, I think the analysis, which uh, is uh, interesting to be done at Eastern's level, uh, misses a big part, which is the reusability. If you observe it, you treat it as a word, as a sentence, okay? But there is more there. There is uh, all the wit, all the interesting aspect that people put in creating that specific uh, uh, piece of information. That's what I think we should focus on because it can lead us to, you know, more ambitious result. So we don't have that kind of annotation at the moment. We have annotation about the um, safeness of the image. So if the image is potentially harmful or uh, for adults, or et cetera, which we did it because we wanted to navigate the data set and uh, giving that to students we don't want to give to students things that are potentially harmful. So we want to have this information for us. Um, then we have uh, we are trying to do some sentiment analysis. Actually, we don't trying. Some student I had did some sentiment analysis, but I wasn't happy uh, with the you know the quality of the pipeline. So we did not share the data in our website at the moment. Absolutely, it's interesting to know if a situation has an intrinsic positive or negative feeling um, and how this uh, mut mutates across possible instances of the situation. That's, I think, is a very interesting uh, uh, question to answer. I, I never thought about it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so there is a question on the chat again. Uh, why memes? Uh, why a meme was created? Uh, yes. So, um, so the, the thing is, that's exactly what you're trying to capture. In that website, know your meme. People typically include three different things. One, the question is, uh, if we have uh, a, a relation, of who created the meme? Why created it? Where it comes from? So the idea is that uh, from this Wikipedia thing of memes, we have uh, the origin something called about and uh, something called uh, like spread okay so we know people spend time to annotate these things the problem is that it's like wikipedia but with that much smaller user base a much less uh, educated let's say in best in good practice of data content cleaning right so the, the text is not reliable we need to do a lot of pre-processing on it we have it I know for a fact that there are good examples and bad examples. Uh, we are trying to build exactly this. What we like to know is uh, all the levels of the picture I show you, right? This, what's going on? What is, what is this about? We also want to know the entities associated to the image, even though they're not really important to understand the context, the meaning, they are a different form of context that might help us uh, better understand the juxtaposition. So like why some people, I'll give you an example from another presentation I have, which I, I, I didn't put it today, but uh, I guess. Uh, so here I, I'm collecting a different example of interesting things about memes, okay? And I think this is quite interesting, right? So you have, uh, this is, the, it's called ooh, ooh, oof, it means, uh, it express is the sound you make when you see someone gets getting hurt and you feel like you share that <laughs> Jesus, right? And these are four, three, three different things like uh, the oof stones on the left, um, Christian Bale and this guy, I don't know where he's come from, right? So they mean the same thing, but they are shared by different people. Why? W what bring me sharing one or the other, right? So what, what is, is a link to the audience. 
And uh, I think these are the shared point. I know there are cultural differences. Maybe they exist some uh, centroids, some things that connect different uh, communities online. Not like ask a, a tool for similarity analysis to compare these images. They're different, right? Completely. But they mean the same thing. Another interesting example we have is this, which I call them bad things, right? So you have the same meme, which uh, means I have something, like I, uh, I have something which is nice, but I'm not happy with it. I'm going to go for novelty, right? And this image is opposite, like uh, is which the sexes, the genders of the participants is exactly the same thing. Is it more likely that a woman shares the one on the right and a man shares the one on the left? We don't know, right? So I think these analyses uh, are uh, quite interesting. How many of these examples are there? You know, infinite. Um, like uh, another, this is my the funniest. This is an image you can hear. <laughs> everybody can really hear this image. And you know exactly, I mean, not everybody, but everybody who rocks. <laughs> so uh, this is, we will rock you, right? Because it's the sound of the song. I have a question, Mega. Uh, yeah, hi, Ricardo. First of hi. all, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Um, so uh, uh, this is a point that I've been uh, wanting to say for a long time. And I think this particular image is a very good place to uh, talk about it. So basically the, the image that you just said, like the boom, boom, clap, and we will, we will rock you. Only people who have heard the song uh, and only people who know the context behind it will be able to hear this meme. Not, not everybody who has, so if somebody has not, never heard the song before or doesn't know that Vin Diesel is actually called rock sometimes, they will absolutely not get the meme at all. So the point that I am trying to come to is when you want to analyze a meme, uh, the context behind it or the background knowledge that goes behind understanding a meme is uh, one of the most integral aspect of uh, analyzing a meme. So For some memes, um, not all the memes. Yeah, like, right, uh, some the, memes there, are, some... there are memes that you can understand how to use them by seeing examples. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Right, right. And uh, so, um, other not, uh, other you need to, to know what you're talking about. Like you need to know the movie behind it. This is actually something we are exactly. trying to test. Like uh, in our approach for gene, we are trying to do meme generation. Actually, meme instantiation, which means we have some con some domain. We have a bunch of existing memes. We have to to apply them to the domain and ask people which one we did it, which one is real. Right, and um, this is something we're trying to do. Uh, it's good. It's very slow uh, for many reasons. Like uh, as you said, it's uh, easy to find bad examples. Um, but the zero hypothesis is: if memes are language, okay, mm -hmm. do I have to study it so they belong to a, a grammar, or they are more like words? So if I have a sufficient number of examples, I can figure it out, figure it out, you know. In the same way you learn, I don't know, you, learn, you didn't learn English by reading the dictionary. You learn English by having a sketch of grammar and then you apply it, you go and wrong a few times and then you, you correct yourself, right? So does it work with memes? I don't know, <laughs> that, that's the cool thing. Like there are a lot of fun and unsolved things here. Um. In, in, in some cases, it is very apparent without any background knowledge, without any other extra information, like the Spider-Man pointing meme. So anybody who sees it will be able to understand what it means, right? But in some other cases, there are some types of memes which are heavily context dependent, which uh, if somebody doesn't know what the story behind it, they'll probably just not be able to get it. But they and are very cool too. Huh? The These are very cool too, because it means that the meme summarizes well the context, which is uh, right. also interesting, right? So I am interested to immediateness. So something which is passes across just by yeah. looking at it. I mean, I think it's also okay. equivalently cool to have a, a piece, a unit of information that as a whole shares, you know, an entire domain with it. That's 
do you know anything else? Like for me, imagine that you are communicating something to a person, right? If you know from the other side, there is that knowledge, your communication speeds up very fast, very much, exactly. right? So, but that's pretty, that's very, that's exactly uh, one aspect of computer science, right? We try to, to do these kind of things, to decentralize, communicate. So the, the focus is on the communication now. Mm. Right. Okay. Thanks. So you're welcome. Thank you for the question. Do you consider slang like dunk memes? Uh, so I said at the moment I'm trying to study memes as abstract creators, right? And, uh, and then uh, we are trying to build a second data set with instances, but there are existing data sets about that. So what I thought was missing was a data set about the context of the meme, which will help a different kind of research. Uh, they, they ideally, what we want is to link with them, right? So. Um, this uh, initiative motion is uh, extremely interesting. I'm definitely gonna look at it and uh, it would be nice to integrate them into a single data set where uh, there was also the NeoRips uh, uh, hateful meme challenge, which we look at. Uh, I think what I would like to do next uh, from a data engineering perspective is uh, a meme generator online, which uh, aids the research. So you can use it and you know that uh, your content will, is going to be completely anonymized yet automatically destructed every time you create an image based on image flip. Uh, that I would like to do because I think we there need is, to get the source. There is a, one paper from the Zure's team on this. And I believe there, is, there are two startups uh, which are actually doing this uh, meme generation uh, automatically and kind of, you know, recommend uh, doing the recommendation so there was really? a, there was a yeah really? there was a startup uh, a very mid-sized startup in india uh, called hike uh, one of my students works there is a reasonably good social you know media platform so they do create automatically indian context wise meme while you are chatting and you know it's really nice and cool. so if you are yeah so they publish that paper my student i mean i'm not there in the paper they published in triple ai probably two years back so, okay. Yeah, so, is about virality, perhaps? No, 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 no. So, creating the memes while you are chatting. So, based on your while we are chatting. Okay, cool. Very interesting. So when, you are, when you are typing something, and it will, they have a you know list of uh, memes. And it can generate as well, and it can give you kind of recommendation while you are chatting. Oh, very nice, very nice. Cool. That I have to look at it. That's exactly one of the points we are trying to to feed. Not not on chats, on static text. But uh, that's very interesting. Yeah, I, I can follow the, those papers. And, you know, uh, please, please, there. please. So let me see. I missed some questions on the chat. Is there any other questions uh, or or even feedbacks? Uh, like, uh, you feel free to even give me a feedback. It doesn't have to be a question. Well, fantastic, uh, uh, Ricardo um, Struns. Um, from the very beginning, I had noted, um, you know, Ricardo uh, has a presence, and um, uh, he presents well. Uh, he interacts well. But there are many things to learn from uh, the technical things, um, how um, uh, somebody formulates the idea. Uh, it makes the talks interesting, makes the conversation engaging. Uh, these are just some of the things I want you to know. Uh, and, and then uh, observing person, I would like you to come to the office every day when Ricardo is um, uh, visiting us or anytime any of our visitors are coming here for short term. So please plan on that and make sure that we get the most out of uh, you know visitors uh, um, whom we are inviting and, and uh, you know, uh, we want to get most out of what they have to offer and also engage in the results we do, who knows, it may lead to uh, collaborations. And that's, that those are the objectives for us. 